good evening friends welcome back to slight alumni associations uh, live videos series i would like to welcome here yadvinder rajvinder singh ji who is head of ai and uh, uh, global head of ai in ericsson uk very great heights you have achieved rajvinder i would congratulate you on that first of all thank you very much to please uh, introduce yourself a bit more your experience how you reached at that level what you did all the struggles in just a small part of it like kind of sure thank you pradeep first of all this is a very good initiative i would like to <clears throat> congratulate you and all your uh, associated staff as well as other members who have started this this is uh, something which is very good uh from different walks of our life i think we should all contribute uh, contribute into this alumni um so i started my career in chandigarh in a small institute uh, in year 2000 then i moved to delhi to a tata group of uh, it companies called tata alexi after that i moved to satyam uh, which is uh, which was in chennai yeah. so i worked in chennai and then in new york and after that i joined another it company csc computer sciences corporation i am in ericsson from uh, around 2011 so i have uh, done different roles in ericsson and then after that uh, in 2017 i was shifted to uk and uh, now i am a, a strategic product manager for um, a particular branch called telco it ai apps which is more related to oss bss side of telco market and um, yeah i mean we we make uh, ai applications or ai software which helps uh, the telco to uh, to achieve their business goals through the insights that we generate from their data but thanks a lot again great great rajvinder we are really really very proud of you and really great to touch you after so many years and see you at such heights i am really Same. feeling great pride and uh, proud Uh, after watching you, I watched you in hostel only, and after that I watched. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, guys, I would like to request all of you that, uh, like Rajvinder, we have a lot of people who have reached great heights from slide, and they are uh, easily connectable, easily reachable. You can have guidance. You can have different forms of support from them. and the best way is always to connect them one on one and meet them you know uh, uh, on actual when you meet them uh, actually you know so we give you a great opportunity great opportunity to meet your alumni on 6th of april in chandigarh you we have a slight alumni meet even students are invited i think invitation is there with you you guys are i would request uh, uh, students in all, uh, at least final year should come and connect with your alumni so that you can get a lot of information new knowledge as well as connections with them because the network is the strongest thing which you can gain from alumni association a uh, lot of people are saying good evening gorav chitwal is uh, also writing thank you gorav great to see mr rajinder mm. after a long of time and proud of his achievements yes certainly we are really proud of him yes uh, so rajinder ji i think we should start with the yes. the yeah. presentation yes, thank sir. you <clears throat> thanks a lot everyone i hope i'm audible so you can ask questions at any slide if uh, if you want so the topic of the day is generative ai the new kid on block on the ai block so that's my topic of the day feel free to stop me and uh, as uh, sarojit paji said uh, you can actually connect i think easiest way to connect also is linkedin you can definitely connect on linkedin as well we are always here to guide the new students yeah on uh, different career choices or even courses that they want to take and that includes students as well by the way of course this is primarily focused not only at final year students but uh, the initial first and second year students as well right so i'll give a bit of an introduction as puri paji said that uh, after hostel he has seen me now itself 
thoughts. I hope uh, uh, it's a, it's a positive <laughs> type of transformation. Uh, but by the way, I'm not a mathematician, and I know a lot of our college mates who are very good in mathematics. I was never good at mathematics, so I'm not a mathematician. But yes, I'm an engineer who accidentally got dragged into all this uh, AI and all that stuff. Uh, my basic background is IT services. So I come from IT service background. Um, so I have my expertise more into managing the um, uh, data centers and application management and all those things. But now I'm into artificial intelligence product management. So I have more than 20 years of IT experience, as I said earlier. So I'm strategic product manager in Ericsson UK, but I maintain a global portfolio. So that essentially means I work not only with UK and Ireland customers, but I work with uh, you know AT and T's, T-Mobiles, and Vodafone or Telstra's and Optus of the world as well. Right. So I'm responsible for telco IT applications portfolio. Let's not go too much into that. And uh, I'm in the UK uh, from seven years now. So this is a bit about me. So this is our agenda for next roughly around 45 minutes. So I'll guide you through some basics. Uh, I don't know my target audience very clearly because it's very wide target audience, by the way. There will be some people who are in year one and there will be some who are already expert in coding, right? So I've tried to balance it a bit. So please forgive me if I go into too much basics or I, I do too much high level, right? Because I don't know the target audience. That's why I've... I've sort of balanced it, right? So we. But I think the basics this. basics will be better because yes, exactly. uh, most of them uh, are, are, you know, not from IT background or may not yes, be using exactly. AI the way it should be used. Exactly, exactly. So I'll go through some basics and then we'll dive into generative AI and some use cases. You know, uh, let's see how much time is there for use cases. Otherwise, I'm happy to take another session as well. How businesses can also benefit from this. Yes. Right? So this is very important diagram, right? And I'll not uh, give you any scientific definition or anything for in mind that all of this is artificial intelligence. So when you hear about machine learning, generative AI, or large language models or foundation models, we are essentially talking about the artificial intelligence. Uh, Puri Paji, I'm in full screen. So if you if you see any questions or if they don't appear here, you can always stop me. Uh, feel free to do that. Yes, yes, certainly. I will I will uh, put up. Uh, Guru Sevak has asked you one question. He is very active, you know, these days. Your mechanical engineer is there to learn from you. Okay. That is really awesome. Thanks a lot, <laughs> uh, Guru Sevak. So what exactly is artificial intelligence, right? Also, again, I'll simplify as much as I can, right? So artificial intelligence, it refers to machines or computer systems that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence, right? So this is very important, that typically requires human intelligence. So these tasks, they include things like learning, reasoning, problem solving, understanding natural language, and perception. So basically, it's about making machines smart enough to mimic human-like cognitive functions. So cognitive functions is a very important point here. Now, a lot of people would say calculator then also is an artificial intelligence because to add one plus one as well, you need some intelligence, right? So actually, calculator is not an AI, right? Because it performs a very predefined mathematical operation. So they lack the ability to learn or adapt new tasks on their own. Right. So anything like a calculator, you know, or similar machines or tools, I would say, you know, which have replaced some like tools have replaced your mechanical uh, work, for example. So earlier you were, you know, taking juice uh, manually, you know, and now you're doing through juicers and all. Right. So uh, similarly, if you if you see computers or calculators, right, I mean, yes, they are, have replaced some of the human um, tasks or brain tasks like addition, multiplication, division, and all, we still don't count them as artificial intelligence, right? They are not artificial intelligence. So when we say artificial intelligence, right? I mean, what exactly is the history? I think it's very important for our, everyone to understand history because, you know, ladies and gentlemen, this has not happened overnight. You know, a lot of times says, or people says, oh my goodness, generative AI overnight has changed the things or artificial intelligence suddenly has changed everything. So it's not sudden. Definitely it was not sudden. You know, 
in 1955, uh, roughly around five to six years after India was, uh, you know, declared an independent country, Tamiyai was coined, right? And in 1966, ELISA was the first natural language processing program. So when we talk about natural language processing, that essentially means whatever I'm speaking now or what I'm, whatever I'm typing, you know, to infer what I'm saying, right? So that is called natural language processing, okay? And then in 1986, there were there were some AI winters for sure in the history. So when we say AI winters, or you hear a term AI winter, that essentially means nothing was done in AI in those those times, right? In those that period or that uh, particular two or three decades. In 1986, very actively, you know, a back propagation algorithm um, uh, was actually worked upon, and that is a key development in training artificial neural networks. Today, I'll not go into deep learning and neural networks because that's a bit of a complex topic. Maybe if there is enough audience or demand, we can take it separately, right? In 1997, then these years are very important because in 1997, Deep Blue defeated, it was an IBM deep, uh, deep learning machine. So it defeated Gary Kasparov in chess, right? That is when AI again became into limelight. Oh my God, someone has defeated, a machine has defeated, you know, uh, Gary Kasparov, right? And then in 2016, and that was Google thing. Earlier it was IBM, then it was Google. So AlphaGo, which was a Google, um, you know, um, algorithm or program or machine learning uh, program, it defeated, uh, you know, uh, the world champion, Lee Sedol. And that was a different game. And it was a complex game than chess because the permutation combinations are more actually. Okay. Then in 2020, that was the year when OpenAI's uh, GPT-3, uh, which is a large scale transformer based language model that started coming into news. Right? So I'm just <clears throat> taking you through the history just to tell you that, <clears throat> no, it didn't happen overnight. Definitely not. You know, it's like 50 or 60 or 70 years in making. You know all these things of course i would have missed some events but uh, these are the critical events right so let's understand let's go through some of the pictures so this is the picture when ai term was actually coined this is the core group you would see some faces here who changed the course of ai history and this is when the poor chap was defeated you know by uh, the the ai program right ibm one and this is when, uh, you know, uh, this is another one. Uh, it's a Jeopardy game. IBM Watson actually won this game. Uh, again, uh, another milestone in AI. And this is when this chap was defeated in Game Go by Google's program, right? Having said that, you know, let's come back to the definition. So what exactly is machine learning, right? So we hear a lot of terms, AI program and all those things. AI is a very wide field, actually. AI is like... You know, we can say it's like, you know, as we call computer science or we say mechanical engineering and all. Artificial intelligence is like that. It's a very, very wide field, right? But machine learning is something which is very specific. So machine learning is a program or system that trains a model from input data, right? That trained model can make useful predictions. Is it a cat or a dog? You know, is it an odd or even and all those things, right? giving computers the ability to learn without explicit programming. Like an artificial intelligence definition, the key point was cognitive there, right? Human brain type capabilities. Now here in this case in machine learning, it's more about the explicit, lack of explicit programming, right? So when in coding we have if then else type of things, right? Coding is more like precise instructions, right? We program everything. But machine learning is not about that. Machine learning is about you give data, label data to a particular system, and that is how it is a program is created, right? So machine learning is always data plus code, right? So why I'm highlighting this is because a lot of times people say that, uh, yeah, machine learning is good, let's start implementing, let's do a project on machine learning and all, but trust me, if you don't have data, you don't have capability to label the data, you don't have data to say that this is a cat, these thousand pictures are actually cats and these 10,000 pictures are dogs. Till that time, machine learning cannot predict or cannot classify a particular picture as a dog or cat, right? 
so a lot goes behind the scenes whereas coding is more plain language plain coding you know machine learning is not coding only it's data plus code and some people say data plus model plus code right that's the highlight of this section so in a way it is like uh, uh, putting a data in a memory of a machine so that machine and uh, guiding the machine through code that this particular data is identified as this for example you are taking as an identification thing only Roughly. then on the basis of that identification then some action this machine can take up right exactly, exactly. this is basically end of the day ai what you are saying and with the learning. new data coming in is learning ability of the machine right exactly learning ability of the machine is very important and then other thing is puri paaji it's very important how much data you give in machine learning right if you have like uh, for example if you don't have data enough data of, on cats or dogs you know there is no way that it will differentiate between a cat and dog right so that is the one more point here if yeah. the data is we are putting a lot of data in ai right so in yes. a way we need really uh, heavy machines to process the data because yes. if the data is uh, in a big numbers you know so yes. end of the day you are uh, uh, moving inside and uh, yeah. processing that data also need a high capability machines I, I in a way agree. like yes. running a code is one thing and processing a data is something else right yes, exactly exactly that is so true that is so true and that is why i would say if you hear about nvidia and all those companies these gpu companies are becoming and that's more business related now nvidia share is jumping a lot these days that is primarily because to train such big models you need lot of data and lot of G gpu capability whereas coding right. was plain cpu capabilities right, right, right now right. the that is why nvidia and all those companies because they are making gpus which was traditionally made for gaming now those same gpus are becoming very popular and essentially for machine learning and generative ai yeah. so do you think in the coming days if we want uh, in in the coming days if ai is going to be you know it is certainly going to be inputted in all the pcs laptops or other machines maybe yes. they may not be laptops in the coming days but whatever machines coming then certainly we will be needing very high end cpus gpus and all the hardware thing uh, which has to be upgraded in the coming few years do you see that as well so um actually no because the thing is once the machine learning model is trained right then it becomes a software program to run that software program you don't need too much computing actually you okay. need a lot of computing when you're training the model right so okay. that is sure but then again it so, depends on model so back end you may be needing a really yes, high end exactly. uh, hardware things yeah yeah exactly once the model is trained and then depending on for example if we are saying i mean you feed for example cancer program right from the brains x ray or ct scan you need to or mri scan you need to figure out whether the person has brain tumor or not right to do that you need like minimum 100000 pictures of the cans of the of the picture of the tumor which was cancer and which was not cancer so that's a classification type so in a way the pictures and the analysis of the doctors yes. uh, experienced doctors in a way yeah. you mean to say the data and the experience of the doctors is exactly exactly in order to uh, give a solution right exactly exactly so that is why i think the next uh, what i'm talking about super just hold on there are, just yes. hold on there are few questions i think we yes, should take yes. them And do explain difference between AI and Chat GPT and machine learning. And uh, uh, I always get confused in these terms. Are they similar or subset of each other? Yeah, that's a very good point, Guru Sir. I will come to that. So I have a particular okay. slide for There that. One yes. more question has come up from Pankaj. He says, "Hello, Rajvinder. What is the difference between AI and IoT?" That's a If very you... good question. That's a very good question. So. Um... so the difference between iot is iot is more about the devices that you put on your machines right so it's called internet of things right so that essentially means that if for example you have 
uh, sugar plant, right? And then in that sugar plant, you put a sensor which measures the temperature which, me which measures the, which also looks at the noise that machines are making, which looks at, uh, you know, I don't know, wear and tear of that particular machine, a sensor basically. And then that sensor transfers the data to a particular database. And then, you know, or it's giving you a signal that you can monitor sitting remotely, right? Mm -hmm. For example, let's say Puri Paji has, uh, you know, or Gursevak has 10 factories, right? So he is not going to all the 10 factories, but in those 10 factories, he has 100 machines. On those 100 machines, it puts sensors, and those sensors are measuring the performance of the machines on whatever parameters, temperatures, humidity, wear and tear, and then transferring that data through internet or through radio signals to your central database. And you have 10 engineers sitting in, let's say, Mumbai or Delhi, or monitoring all those machines, right? That becomes typically an internet of things type of thing, right? So there is no I can give one more example. Yes, yeah. very good. So I can give one more yes. yes, yes, yes. It is like uh, these days, you know, even far in farming, IoT is being used where yes. they are using sensors for uh, irrigation that a farmer sitting at home uh, through his app can see whether the, my land needs irrigation now or not. This exactly. is one example. IoT, like exactly. That. This is one example, you know, of IoT and machines or others. So you put sensors, you collect data, and then you take decisions on basis of that data. Yes. Should you send a maintenance engineer in three months or two months or one month? That is there. Now, very interestingly, machine learning also comes into picture on that. If you have enough data, for example, you are running them for two years, then, you know, machine learning can actually predict whether your maybe your machine can actually break down in one month. The reason for that is because, you know, you have data of 10 other machines which broke down after the temperature has gone to 70 degrees or 700 degrees. Then, you know, once it reached 100 degrees, the machine was gone. The machine broke down. So that essentially means if your machine has reached 700 degrees 10 times in one hour, you should immediately dispatch a particular engineer to fix that. That is where prediction comes. Okay. So that is the machine learning. So IoT is one field, machine learning and AI is other. Yeah. So this is what, but IoT is purely sensors and collection of that data through sensors. But data collection and connectivity becomes very important in IoT. So now coming to the types of machine learning that I was saying, supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforced learning. These are a couple of examples. I'll quickly go through them, right? Supervised learning is this, as I told you. Training a supervised learning is you feed hundreds and thousands of picture into a model and then model once trained. And that is Puripaji where a lot of uh, GPUs and CPUs, they, the lot of processing is required, right? But there once it is you have a program already trained, then that program can run on a simple chip or a camera or your sensor as well, right? So right. then what happens is, once the model is trained, you feed a picture and you tell the model, right, okay, which is dog, which is cat, or which is chicken, then they make prediction on the basis of the training that they got, right? So this is typically supervised learning. For example, your spam emails, that's a typical example. If you use right. Google, you never write that if an email is coming from, let's say, a lottery guy or a person in Nigeria, then you move it into a spam folder. The Google has a program which is trained that if you are looking for keywords like free or send me money or the mail is coming from a particular IP address from Russia or Nigeria, you by default put it into spam folder. It can make, make mistakes as well, by the way. Okay. That, that is okay, but on the whole, 90%, 95%, it is 90% right? they are accurate. 90% they are accurate. And more data you give, more accuracy comes. Yeah. Okay. Then unsupervised learning is basically it's it's an algorithm where you don't train it specifically, but you know it automatically creates some clusters on the basis of whatever. Again, you need to feed a lot of data, but the machine is capable in itself making some clusters as well on data. So I'll not go too much into this because these are sometimes a bit complex topics. Now coming to 
what Gurseva was saying. What is generative AI and what is chat GPT and all those things. So let's see what is generative AI now. Okay. You learned about so what we have learned till now is the history of AI. Okay. How AI uh, evolved. You know, what were the major um, sort of timestamps in the history of artificial intelligence? What is artificial intelligence definition wise? Calculator is not an AI machine. Okay. Then we discuss what's machine learning. You know, how is it different from specific coding? And then we learned what is supervised learning, what's unsupervised learning. Now coming to generative AI, right? Rajvinder, we are, I am feeling as if we are taking a lecture from a fantastic uh, professor, not <laughs> from an industry expert. Really good, really good. I, I told you are, are we, such a low level and, you know, put it in our minds yeah. in such a beautiful way. We are really good. Thank, thank you. I hope I can add value to yeah, yeah, you are adding value, a lot of value. Yeah. So AI algorithm that generates new data, that is similar to the data it was trained on, that is generative AI. So the term that it's generating something, that is generative AI, very simply, you know. So it's a subset of machine learning, by the way. For, for sure, it's a subset of machine learning. Then, of course, a lot of people, uh, yeah, of course, a lot of terms like deep learning and all, they are there, but maybe for some other session. So generated content could be text, images, code, audio, and video. So I like this diagram very much. This is the best diagram. This is from Google, right? So discriminative technique or traditional machine learning. Let's call traditional machine learning a discriminative technique. As I told you, you show the picture of a dog and then the algorithm classify. Uh, it says it is a dog, okay? You show the picture of a cat, it will say it's a cat, okay? You show the picture of horse, it will not say anything because the model was not trained. E was only trained on cat or dogs. If it's horse, it will not say anything to you. Whereas in Gen AI, right, you know, you show the picture of a dog and then what it will do is it will create a picture of another dog. Okay, that is the difference between generative and discriminative, which is traditional machine learning, right? That is why it is it is very, very transformative. It's very, very revolutionary. Because you're not only asking whether this thing in the x-ray is, is a cancer or not, or a brain tumor. That is traditional machine learning, right? So another example. Why I'm emphasizing on this is because a lot of times we get always confused between the predictive and generative, right? So you give data to a model. Uh, upper side you give labels label means you put the name whether it's a cat or a dog okay you put the labels on thousand pictures these are cats these thousand pictures are dogs okay then it predicts a label this is a cat this is a dog whereas generative model you know you put a lot of unstructured content you don't do labeling you put unstructured content into that then generative AI model, because it's using transformers and all, it learns patterns in unstructured right? and this gives an output as a new content. So new content, because it generates new content, that's why it's called generative AI, right? So chat GPT is generative AI. We'll come to that, okay? What's the secret sauce here, right? I mean, what exactly is such a big thing about generative AI? Generative AI uses foundation models. Right? So what exactly is a foundation model? This is important to learn. Foundation model is an algorithm that is pre-trained with extremely large data sets scrapped from public internet. Okay. Traditional ML models are trained on a particular single task. Is it a dog or is it a cat? Is this tumor benign or is this tumor cancer? Okay. Particular task, single task. The models are trained on single tasks. Okay. Foundation, for example, you cannot ask, uh, uh, you know, the cancer program, whether it's a cat or a dog, okay? These are two different um, things. The foundation models are trained with wide variety of data and can transfer knowledge from one task to another. So foundation model is trained once and then fine tuning to complete different type of, and this is Puripaji where you said you need big machines. Because foundation models, you know, for example, OpenAI, has spent millions of dollars to create these foundation models. They contain hundreds of billions of hyperparameters that have to be trained with hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of data. 
like for example the chat gpt program uh, in the backend it's gpt it's trained on nearly 300 million web pages right and you know other thing now which is coming into picture is copyright infringement for example it's trained on a model uh, it's trained on data which was there on longwall website right or your business website for example now it is trained and it will start answering whatever your business is about or what is longwall college is about so recently, New York Times has actually put a case on open AI. Yes, and yes, yes. Why did you use our data? Right? We never told you to use your our data. Yes, right? yes. They have put a case on them. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So that case study is a very important case study that you know sometimes these people who are making this foundation models or large language models, they are actually using the data without even permission of a person. Right? Actually, this has been done by Google also. Well, a lot of times, a lot of times. Yes, so yes. Everything. I think in the starting yeah. days only, because when yeah, they made the search engine, they took the data with the, without asking them, they downloaded yes. everything. Yeah, and this exactly. is what has happened earlier also. Exactly. So nowadays, data secrecy is becoming and an important issue yes. world over because of the AI thing only. That is why now exactly. the things have started moving in. Exactly, exactly. So all of you be very careful of what you're putting on Facebook about your business. And of course, you have to do it. I'm not saying you don't. But, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, at the end of the day, you are either a cat or a dog for that, you know, to be very honest, just to put you in perspective. <laughs> so once completed, each foundation model can be modified then unlimited number of uh, these things, right? So that is a foundation model. Now, coming to Gursevak's question, what is AI, what is chat GPT, you know, and what is generative AI? Open AI is just a company, okay? Chad GPT is one of the, uh, one of the foundation model or a pre-trained transformer. So GPT means generative pre-trained transformer. Transformer is a type of model that they have used in the backend. So GPT is generative pre-trained transformer. Another program which is very famous for OpenAI is Dell E. Dell E is a is an um, if you have a subscription, I think it's ten dollars per month. Then you can generate a lot of pictures from Dell E, right? So you can all use it for your businesses if you are in creative uh, uh, content like Puripaji is. Definitely Dell E is something which you which is worth considering. So the name play on the famous artist uh, Salvador Dali, uh, he's a very funny character. And then the Pixar character Wally, if you have seen. So Dali yeah. doesn't mean anything like GPT means generative pre-trained. Dali is nothing. But is OpenAI the only player? No. Google has no budget. OpenAI has Dali and GPT. Meta has Llama, which is an open source model, which we use in Ericsson a lot. And then there are others. I'll not go into details of that. But what, all I'm saying is that you know, OpenAI is not the only one. There are a lot of new players, right, and coming into picture. So I hope I answered Gursevak's question that what is AI? You know, what is... So I would like to ask one more question. Ki, yes. uh, while putting up a data on a website or maybe on social media channels, yeah. what should we take care of so that, uh, you know, uh, so that we can, as a business owner, I feel that the business should go to more people, right? Yeah, my my business should be visible to as many people as possible, whether they call me dog or cat, that doesn't that is OK. Yeah. But end of the day, it should reach more people so that we can be connected to more of our customers. Right. Exactly. So here uh, being uh, the world of AI and uh, AI is uh, our generative AI is working on Internet as well as in a in a different ways. Even these days, AI is coming up in content creation in a multiple ways. Yes. Uh, what kind? How we can use our websites? Uh, uh, what kind of content or creation of content or maybe coding uh, variation in our content uh, should be done so that uh, we should be able to make uh, take benefit of AI? You know. Yes, I'll come to those okay. use cases, Puripaji. But one thing is for sure: if your information is already publicly available, do that. Yeah. You you share that information. All I'm saying is you share that information. But in social, your website is a different thing. But if you are doing it on Facebook, normal social media posts, be careful not to give phone number of your kids, you know, or too that's, much about that's that. something those, else, yeah. yeah those things I'm you have to be business care. part of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then on the when you are a business owner, never put your 
uh, intellectual property protected stuff on internet right. right you always say you contact us if you need blueprints for this okay right. you know you do not put too much of your uh, commercial model what is your model how you are right. charging and all those things so be careful on those things that's what i'm right. saying yeah great so that is very important to be aware of if it's a public information that's perfectly fine but if that's okay it's a complicated... so you have to be careful uh, yes. what should be put on what should not be put on exactly exactly so that is what i'm saying yeah so now the bigger question is what's in it for you as puripa ji rightly said what are the use cases right so it's a lot actually it's you can take a lot of benefits from this for sure you know other thing is that yes it's sometimes a bit intimidating and uh, it's uh, it's uh, coming from this field it's it's a bit uh, how to say scary also scary as well yeah a sort of uh, cannibalism type of thing maybe it will take a lot of jobs right so that essentially means for you and for your uh, kids or anybody because now we have kids we are we uh, right and i think it's very very important to to be in the field where there is very less copy fill type of, copy and paste type of thing right mm -hmm. so a lot of i mean i not put anybody into bracket or judge anybody but a lot of companies i know you know they were like doing lot of work on a copy paste basis from the internet right anyways so now that content is you can generate through chat gpt or anybody your business customers can also generate for example i told chat gpt can you generate a code in python to find odd number right so it gave me in like 5 seconds then i also said that can you write a sql query to find standard deviation from a table right so it gave me in like 2 3 seconds i right. said uh, what's cognitive bias right i want to understand what exactly is cognitive bias okay and then it gave me the answer then i also said that uh, you know if you i don't know if you can see but you know lot of times what i do is that if i put something to be presented to a customer and customer is a ceo or the other customer is more like a technical engineer in a team i write i ask chat gpt that you know do you think a ceo would understand this definition then they tell us that yes ceo is fine but you can modify it like this but for engineer it's too high level you should go into a bit more of details right no i think in the case of chat gpt i have used it a lot actually so in this case i think you also need to train yourself in order to use it exactly okay, so it's not like that you just question <laughs> so it will give you the right answers for that yeah. you have to see you have to go through the answers and you have to understand this is how i can ask a question from a chat gpt and they will exactly, answer exactly puripa so yeah, that, that is where that is also required that is where so, prompt engineering comes into picture so lot yes. of you who are still fresh in career you know yeah. and then uh, rajvinder you give me keywords to browse and learn for next 2 3 months rest you always my query is well addressed okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay good i'll do that kirse but so so there is one so, more question from vipin mishra Yes, yes. Please. But then, when we use Dali for our personal work, it is not giving good results. And when we saw images on other platforms, how uh, can we use Dali optimized? That's what you need more training, guys. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. I have a question. When we use Dali for our personal work, it's not giving good result. As we saw images on other platform, how can we use? Okay, that is, I think, that is where I was coming when Puri Paji also asked. that you also need to know what questions you need to ask and ladies and gentlemen that is called prompt engineering right yes, so what what is called prompt prompt yes. engineering yes yes so you need to learn and by the way for you youngsters out there learn about prompt engineering okay because now there is a whole business which is starting you know and uh, uh, learn about this if anyone is interested we can definitely discuss that but there's a whole business of what questions you need to ask chat gpt to get a particular answer so i think when, getting a picture and you are explaining the picture that explanation explanation is really important right yes that is one so other thing is, computer, na, this is what i want 
I think exactly. the same way it is very difficult to explain a human being also. Yes, that is. You want a picture? Is... You just explaining a human being. You draw a picture. I think uh, it's it's not that easy to explain what is in your mind. I agree, and that is called prompting. So prompt engineering or prompting is it is becoming a very good side business. Yeah, learn prompt engineering. Yes. So prompting is becoming very important because you know you can actually start earning money on some platforms. Search for those platforms, and you can start money when, for example, in Delhi also, you want to generate a particular picture. people have created the pictures which you can then put into delhi and it generates a particular picture okay as a consequence right. similarly text wise as well now for example you say you know can you guide me on jobs for example you say how would the model knows which jobs you are talking about right we right. have to say i am in indian market i want to learn about jobs in united kingdom which are related to mechanical engineering then it will give you 50 jobs but when you say i need to learn about jobs in mechanical engineering in companies like jaguar aston martin land rover which are related to you know i don't know automatic gears or you know more related to electronic vehicles and in electronic vehicles what that is called prompting Okay. So it means so the more specific you are, more specific you are, it's much better. The better, better answer you will get. Yes, exactly, exactly. And specifically in Dell E, there are a lot of prompts which are available. The pictures are available. People are selling those pictures, which when you put into Dell E, it will give you the picture, what the outcome, what you are looking for, precisely like that. Yeah. So this is called prompt engineering. so very good uh, discussion topic actually what we are talking about now coming to what experts are saying right ai use cases so you can definitely use gen ai for call centers and customer service software development life cycle content creation marketing and back office and document summarization or even document creation now keep one thing in mind ladies and gentlemen that these four boxes they are very narrow boxes there are 10 other use cases if anybody wants to learn i can definitely guide them separately but other thing that you have to be very careful for the business owners who are in this group for them this is an opportunity okay yes definitely an opportunity but for the students who are in machine learning data science mathematics or even computer sciences please treat this as a positive type of threat as well. Okay, why I'm saying positive type of threat? You need to up your game a bit. Okay, that essentially means if you are still copy pasting and writing basic programs, think about why would anyone employ you after five years if they can get all that from ChatGPT? Okay, so you need to understand that you know which particular areas you need to excel in. Don't feel threatened. for sure as i said prompt engineering and there are some other elements like vector dbs like fine tuning like rag and all those are the topics you, which you should also be understanding because there are bulk of companies who cannot use chat gpt they need con specific content which is related to yes yes, yes. so chat gpt cannot answer everything exactly it's not it's not for everybody right and the other thing is for business owners here my other request is or someone who's who are working in corporate or even youngsters who are working in infosys tcs and all those things do not put your code on chat gpt don't do that please because you are feeding it to learn from your code and you are also leaking your company's confidential data to chat gpt chat gpt is purely purely public domain okay If, for example, Gursevak or Puri Paji or anybody is putting their company's blueprint and asking suggestions from them on basis of that blueprint, that means you are leaking it to the internet, right? Yes. So that is where I think guardrails, the data privacy, and all those things are very, very important. So ask yourself: just because it's appearing to you as a chatbot, it's not a chatbot; it's a completely public thing. okay if you are using chat gpt there is no way you can do that coming back to then some business owners on this group 
that essentially means that if you are looking for specific to your own business, then you have to think about open source models like Llama and all from Facebook, which you can definitely do a lot of prompt engineering. And if you need any guidance on that, please let me know and I can help you on that. So don't put any confidential or intellectual property type of thing onto chat GPT and others. Be very clear. Sir, uh, Rajvinder ji, tell mm -hmm. me one thing as you have talked about call centers and customer service. Yes. We are into this particular domain from the last almost 10, 12, 13 years. It's my yes. personal question. So uh, can we create a model which can be trained in order to answer specific questions from the uh, from any anybody from the customers? Yes, you can definitely do that. And Puri Paji, if you need to specifically train the chatbot on yes. to your own area like rural marketing, right? Like maybe then, agriculture, maybe pesticide, yeah, specific crop, right? Yeah, exactly, right? So specific, and that is where, uh, you know, something called prompt engineering again comes into picture. Right. You right. need to feed the data into it through a vector DB. So that essentially means it becomes a bit complex, but if somebody wants to do that, AWS SageMaker Jumpstart and all, there are some good tools to explore how you can put your specific data on, into the answers. If you need basic, basic type of thing, then you can no, no, I, I'm it. saying uh, one is chatbot, another is actually a voice model kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. You can do that as well. Yes, okay. definitely you can do that. So both the AWS, things is possible. Yes. Yes. If we start developing now, maybe in the next two, three years, we will be able to give something really fantastic to a particular set of customers, right? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. It can definitely do wonderful things for your business, for sure. So AWS right. Bedrock, AWS Bedrock is a good uh, tool set. And then AWS uh, SageMaker Jumpstart is more if you already know AWS type of thing. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. Open AI is not the only thing. If you need to explore for your yes. business, please yes. do that. And for students and youngsters, on if, if they are there in the call, learn about AWS Bedrock, learn about AWS SageMaker Jumpstart. Those are some good skills to have for sure. So don't only don't always feel threatened that oh my God, you know, Open AI will take your jobs. But you look at jobs through these fields. It's it's good actually. Uh, Sashi Paul says, where exactly we can use Gen AI in SDL? Uh, Sashi, you have to guide me on SDL. Is it software development lifecycle? Okay, I think he will type because it takes yeah. two, three, five seconds. There is a difference. Yes, no of, you know. no so in a way, there's one more question. Where does artificial intelligence go from here and how much job scope is there in future of AI students? Sashi Paul says, yes. Yes. So Sashipal, in a software development lifecycle, you can generate code from these things, right? So that essentially means if, if for example, you know, and uh, try to go to Bing and there is a, there, if you go to bing.com, there is something called Copilot. You go to Copilot, right? And it'll, if you don't have, go, go to ChatGPT, go to Copilot. And then, you know, you can actually do a lot of things over there. You can actually even create code from this. So that's what I'm saying that, look, if you're a software developer, be careful of how you are using it. Do not give your companies proprietary, you know, type of thing. But if you're a business owner and you need basic coding type of thing, then you don't have to learn Python or anything. You go to ChatGPT or go to Copilot in Bing.com you can actually generate a lot of easy type of codes as well. If you need some SQL queries or you need to analyze your financial data, for example, Sachipal, if you are a business owner, you have five- He is a business years. owner. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Pal is Sashi a fantastic is... business owner and he is yeah. into uh, this, uh, he's into software only and he is into uh, particular type of, so I just forgot the thing. And okay. he is into very deep uh, software things, and Which he is, is really doing well. Okay. So, so I think right. only thing, Sachipal, only thing, Sachipal, if you are into software, you know, just be careful that if you are generating a code through Chat GPT and you are using in your customer application, 
you have to be a bit careful because code will be generated but then how that code is generated from where it has i i would not say stolen but actually it is stolen yeah then it's uh, it's uh, somebody might actually sue you in the long run right so that essentially means take feedback from from the chat gpt so or even have a guidance or, kind of stuff yeah but please do not copy paste blindly because you don't know using which model it has using which data it has been trained on if maybe they find out later they'll say why did you use our code if we never authorized that right so but yes in software development life cycle and even in software testing life cycle generative ai plays a very good role for business owners you can do lot of uh, your basic programming yes. pal is into blockchain sorry i just forgot the name oh, okay okay blockchain yeah i mean blockchain is a bit of a new field because you know blockchain coding i would say i have never tried that but then blockchain is i don't think chat gpt or these programs are trained on too much of blockchain data or blockchain coding because blockchain coding is so a you new can build your own and train it <laughs> so yeah. that people can have exactly. a benefit out of it <laughs> yeah da- download uh, facebook's uh, llama so and, gaurav uh, has yeah. given his details shashipali ceo of ntr ntr solutions specialized in blockchain technology helping okay. us lightens in a big way yes he has been he has given a lecture before that also and he is really good at the thing that is very good so proud of uh, the work which everyone is doing so there's one more question has come in where does artificial intelligence go from here and how much job scope is there in future for ai students i think rg and company is asking for their kids for sure <laughs> i'm just joking kids and for slightians as well <laughs> yeah as slightians as well. i think artificial intelligence with generative ai has become mainstream i think that's one of the good thing it has done before chat gpt tell me how many of you actually knew about artificial intelligence right not many people knew about ai apart from yes. movies and magazines and all so what generative ai and chat gpt it has done is it has it has democratized or it has it has it bought ai into the mainstream right so that is a achievement actually so tell me rajender one more point like there is one more scope uh, where i was talking to you regarding uh, call centers and customer service similarly there are multiple ways of uh, you know catering to customers in a multiple ways everybody is catering to customers whether he is in job or in uh, uh, or in business or whatever way like i mean to say there is a great scope of actually training the models right yes so for so, a specific more creating specific models and training well, them with big yes, data is a great scope is, isn't it yes exactly i to me it looks to and what how i am anticipating this is gen ai would definitely democratize the artificial intelligence that essentially means you know lot of new jobs will be created so now if previously people were more keen on training doing the model uh training the ml models on to you know some specific tasks now the new jobs which will be there they'll be into fine tuning the foundation models they'll be in uh, during something called rag prop which is part of prompt engineering rag is retrieval augmentation generation so those type of topics they are very they'll be very very important now it will definitely generate lot of jobs for artificial intelligence uh, uh, engineers you know for sure but i think from plain machine learning you need to augment your skills towards generative ai specifically when it comes to prompt engineering type of thing because see foundation models they are already created you know as right. a company you cannot do that because you know you will never have money in millions or billions to train those models now the beauty is if there is a basic foundation model or a large language model in particular related to languages how to train it to suit your own requirements for your right right that that's what i yes so yes. learn about vector db learn about prompt engineering learn about rag which is retrieval uh retrieve retrieved augmented uh, uh generated so those concepts those are very important in, in the future so coming uh, towards the end yes vector db and drag is very important so you see this poem yeah 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 <laughs> you created it 
<laughs> so chat gpt created it the original one was this i gave him two or three lines and then this is what chat gpt created for me uh, but look the thing is again i think very important aspect here is that do you want to keep something personalized with your signatures chat gpt will never do that okay so i think that is my message to the youngsters if you see the punjabi it has created i think sorry to use the word it's ridiculous you know longwall with yeah. jeevan mera sohavan si there's no word for sohavan bina chingare de de ye punjabi par punjabi and many languages is not working well so this is what i mean to say we need to work on some models where we can train in order to use that particular thing exactly. which we can actually use it to sell to the people you know exactly. similarly there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of domains where we can train yes. and build our own models which may take one year two years time Precisely. but Precisely. after one or two years you will have something to sell actually end of it exactly exactly so i think the thing here is and that is where i would uh, correct you puri pa ji actually now with generative ai you cannot create your models foundation models are already created there yeah. are yeah. around yeah. 12 so i'm not one... talking about foundation i'm talking yes. about specific solutions yeah yeah specific solution you can create and i think that is my uh, request to all the students you know or youngsters you start learning about as puri pa ji said how to make the foundation model very specific for a particular business and that is where i think fine tuning people say fine tuning and all sorry but fine tuning again is a very resource intensive type of thing but you in beginning you start studying about what's the difference between rag prompt in, uh, rag is part of prompt engineering what's the difference between prompt engineering and fine tuning where you use prompt engineering where you use fine tuning and what are the different methods in prompt engineering in particularly rag or rag is a very important thing to understand for next 2 3 years after that maybe it's fine tuning and all so this is uh, the end of my presentation uh, but um, i'm willing to take more questions yeah and you can connect me through email or through linkedin i'm not uh, very active in all the groups in whatsapp yeah but uh, i'm quite decently active on linkedin so guys uh, this was really a great session um, rajinda you just nailed it it was really really good and uh, we learned a lot a lot from you because this is something a burning topic kind of stuff these days and a lot of opportunities have opened up because of ai and a lot of people can do great things which were not possible before that and uh, or or even if it was possible it was uh, about to cost a lot of money and resources in order to do the things which now is possible without uh, you know uh, putting in so much of resources or you may not be needing that many human resources i understand this may uh, uh, send a feeling of you know joblessness to a lot of people but i believe when a, when computers came in i still remember when computers came in uh, uh, a lot of people were saying that uh, it will eat up the jobs but i believe after computers came in the jobs were actually in increased yeah. and india yeah. has grown like anything after the computers came in and even when we joined colleges even rajinder you joined the college i think we were not knowing much about computers when we joined it and once we joined in we studied we studied languages at that time and that was the time when the we were just learning computers and we a lot of many of us actually joined computer science engineering he they might not have done engineering in computer science but they have moved into it they have used it and this was really really great thank you um, saksena sir saksena sir have also joined great informative session rajinder proud of you and harpreet is saying uh, can ml and ai be implemented in robotic solution harpreet singh is basically robotic uh, engineering yeah. company head he is a senior as well so he is more interested to do that yeah but we will not do it for free uh, for you harpreet paji so yeah you have to for that yeah, knowledge you have to treat me a bit yeah <laughs> 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 next time we meet and then we i'll tell you how you can implement it in robotic 
<laughs> Great. So, so something can be done in a way. Yeah, definitely. So it was really great, very informative session. Uh, uh, LinkedIn profile account, I think you have already shared. I've shared uh, on the PDF, yeah, it's there. Yes, yes there, uh, but still you can share it on WhatsApp also so that people can. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. So uh, thank you, Rajvinder. It was really great session. It is complete 60 minutes now. And I think we should, uh, we will be ending up the session. And at the end of the session, I will request all of you to please register for Alumni Association's meet on 6th of April, Saturday in Chandigarh. So I will request Rajvinder also, if possible, please come sure, or uh, motivate your friends to join that. Uh, although Gursevak is on the job, but a lot of yeah. people, <laughs> we need another people for motivating. Uh, yes. I think uh, a lot of people uh, have not uh, registered yet, including Shashipal. I think Shashipal, you should also register with your friends and classmates. So all of you who have joined, please uh, register immediately. So already 25 people have registered. So we need more people. I think we are expecting around 200 people in this particular event so that it should be a great networking event and good things should happen. I would like to add one more thing here. When we started this, um, uh, you know, initiative, it it started with the, our last year Utkarsh one uh, event, which happened in April fifteenth, uh, two thousand twenty-three, and in that uh, event, it was for only nineteen ninety-eight pass out batch. But uh, a lot of associations, because of that, a slight alumni association started in a big way it was already there but it was not really very active it became really active after that and i would like to tell you many business associations have started after that even i am talking to uh, our uh, slight friends around in three four different groups where we are talking about run, uh, building a new company and product and we are uh, in some cases we are very near of building some products as well and similar associations are happening in different ways, different places, different things. So I would like to, a lot of jobs have happened. A lot of uh, uh, trainings have been, uh, you know, arranged by a, a slight uh, alumni. A lot of uh, sessions like this, uh, similar sessions have been done by a lot of people on this particular YouTube channel only. So I would request that if you come there, especially students as well as uh, other alumni, uh, alumni, you can have a great network. Like, for example, today we are talking to Rajvinder and a lot of people are asking Rajvinder how to automate their own, you know, segments, including me. Certainly, Rajvinder can be a part of many companies in the coming days if he wishes to. <laughs> or maybe startups which can be built up on a specific solutions, which he, as he knows the domain. Similarly, different domain people, different experience people, when joined together, they really build up something great. Similar is with the students as well. We need more young energy as well. So I would request all of you to please register for Slight Lumini Association meet on 6th of April. I think it's uh, it seems as if too much of advertising, but still we want you to uh, please uh, join. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.